So um, there's a story that has been told to me and my family, and I'm assuming it's true because I don't want to believe that my parents uh, lie to me. Um, So I have two stories that I'm going to tell. I'm going to tell the the later one first and then the other one. The later one is that when I was like about probably 17, 18 years old, uh, this evangelist came to our church, and um, it was all about, he was like a a prayer and healing and miracles type of evangelist. And so uh, I really felt God... I was in the balcony at my church in Arkansas, and I really felt like God was like, hey, I felt like God said, uh, give all the money in your wallet, and you'll never have to wear glasses again. So I gave him $10, because I'm 17, and I wear glasses. Okay, so that's story number one. The second story comes from when I was a little kid. So when I was a little kid, the story's been told to me that I did not walk or talk until well after I was two years old. The reason why is because I had been diagnosed or I was on the process of being diagnosed with cerebral palsy. And then one night at our church in Omaha, Nebraska, they prayed for me at a prayer meeting. And the very next day, I said my first word and took my first step. So I have to deal with that tension between my 10 bucks, my faith seed, my faith promise, whatever, and the fact that someone prayed for me when I was two. And in that tension lies everybody's questions about healing and about the miraculous. I mean, it really does. Because there's a lot that we can sort of be on pace with when it comes to God, right? But this idea that God somehow steps into the natural order of things and defies the very laws of reality that we base our lives on. That's tough. Some people are all about it. Some of you, if I were to say, God, we live in an age of miracles, some of you would say, yes, we do, amen. Here's 15 just from today. Some of you, you would say, come on, come on. Don't give me that. We had this guy in my church growing up who said that he, he, one time he was running low on gas and he prayed for his truck and he never had to fill his gas tank up again that his car perpetually ran on gas. And I share that story, and the look on everybody's faces right now is, come on. But yet, in the Bible, we see a story where Elijah prayed for a woman, and she had enough meal, like flour, meal, and oil, and it never ran dry. So in his mind, it was the same miracle. If God did it for her, why couldn't he do it for him? So when we talk about healing and we talk about the miraculous, and I'm kind of putting them together, because in some ways they share sort of a common, in my, in my personal theology, my personal opinion, they share a common basis. They share a common basis. So our critical question for tonight is really this, does God heal? Does God heal? And it's a significant question. Because for some, your answer is yes. But then if I ask the next question, which is, will God heal? that becomes a different answer. So theologically, intellectually, where I live most of my spiritual life, I would say, yes, God can heal. But if you were to say, then why do you still wear glasses? I'm like, but will God heal? I was sharing with, uh, uh, this is on video, so I can't, you know, I was sharing with a couple, a young couple in our, in our, in our group earlier, um, I took a spiritual gift, gift inventory one time, you know, the things you take from like Saddleback and all that, and I took a test, and it, one of them was the gift of healing, and I got a zero. So I actually, if you need healing, please, I, stay away from me. My fear is that I have negative healing points, actually. I mean, I try to roll every once in a while, I can roll like my critical points up a little bit, but for the, that was a very specific reference, like I'll hit a D20 and be like, yay, but other than that, my, it's very low. Faith and healing, very low for me. Teaching, high. You got the sniffles, you're going to want to go see Pastor Charlie. Like that, you're going to want to move on very, very quickly, okay? So I'll be honest with you. I'm coming from a point in this material tonight that I personally wrestle with. And I always want to be transparent about that. Because healing is one of those things that demands the tension of, if them, why not them? And that's just the, the raw truth of it. So what I want to do is I want to introduce a formal doctrine to you then we'll process from that. So our formal doctrine when it comes from my tradition, which is a denomination called the Assemblies of God or Cooperative Fellowship, 
called the, the Assemblies of God. Uh, it's a classical Pentecostal denomination. So the Pentecostal stance on healing is always this. Divine healing is an integral part of the gospel, which means that it's embedded in the truth of the gospel. Deliverance from sickness is provided for in the atonement. If you want to circle that line right there, circle that word atonement. And is the privilege of all believers. It is the privilege of all believers. You say, well, what does that mean? It means this. Part of the good news that Christ brought is that we can be physically healed in this life. Deliverance from sickness is a result of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. And that gift or that experience is something that every believer can believe for and anticipate. Okay? And that's really what it's saying. And we'll get to the atonement ideal here in a second. But that's the essence of it. Now, this is critical because, number one, it explains sort of the, what's the right, almost the mechanics of healing, like how does it work, where does it come from? And I'll get to that when we get into the, the teaching, more of the, the formal belief statements. But this right here, this line, and it's the privilege of all believers. That's where the tension point comes in because I still wear glasses and my knee hurts and my back hurts and I get migraines. I'm kind of a wreck, guys. I'm just going to be honest with you. I injured my shoulder playing the tuba when I was 16 years old. Like, stuff happens. We've probably got enough aches and pains here to say, I don't know if it's the privilege of all believers. So we struggle with this because what happens is when we say, I prayed for healing and it's supposed to be for everybody and I didn't get it, it must be my fault. Okay? In fact, you see that in John chapter 9. As you, many of you know, John chapter 9 is one of my most favorite stories in all scripture. The man born blind, the Pharisees asked, who sinned that this man is, was born blind, him or his parents? So they're equating sin to sickness, and therefore, if there's no healing, there must be a sin problem. And the truth is, is that all we say, well, that's the old covenant. Some of us carry or have heard a version of that same thing in our lives currently. So in all of this, we have to start asking, if I want to know more about healing, for me, the way that I work off of and just the way that I have to answer or resolve these tensions in my own heart is the why. Why? So while our critical question is, does God heal? I actually, when I first wrote the drafts of this, my original question was, why does God heal? Why? Because if I can maybe understand why, then I can also maybe understand why not. Okay? So, could be interesting. All right, here we go. So let me give you the big idea, and then we'll move forward. Healing and other miraculous signs point us to Jesus. If you don't hear anything else that I say tonight, if you don't get anything else from this session, that's your critical idea. That any time God intervenes in the natural workings of humanity, the main priority, which I'll demonstrate scripturally here in a moment, the main priority is to draw attention back to him. Okay? So that's what, that's what I do. When I come and I pray for healing, when I come and I ask for a miracle, when I believe, ultimately, scripturally, biblically, we know that those signs occurred to point people to Jesus. So does God heal? Yes. Why does God heal? To point people back to himself. Now already this could be stretching some different theologies or beliefs on healing. This is, this is what I'm saying. You may have a different perspective, and that's perfectly awesome to have. But I think one thing that's critical, and I know, hey, Brian, it was healing. Thanks for being so depressing. But it's this statement, which is this. I believe that having a healthy theology of healing actually requires a healthy theology of suffering. So I'm just saying, get out the Ben and Jerry's. It's going to get dark, okay? All right. It's going to get, I'm just saying. But we have to wrestle with this idea because embedded in the idea that God wants to heal me is also implying the idea that any suffering I experience must be bad and therefore I should be alleviated from it, okay? So just follow me here. 
There is a common philosophical problem, especially maybe those of you who wrestled with faith or you're still on the sidelines or you're watching this later and you're still trying to figure out if you believe in God, and it's called the problem of pain or the problem of evil, right? The best way that I can describe this problem is why do bad things happen to good people, okay? And basically when you hear it, it's like this. Okay, if God is all powerful and all loving, then everyone should be happy all the time So he's either all-powerful and he doesn't love, or he's all-loving and he's not all-powerful, therefore there's no God, okay? And people are like, oh, that's it. That's why I don't believe in God. The problem is that God is all-powerful to do everything that's possible. But there's a problem with saying that God wants everyone to be happy. That's not a true statement. God doesn't want us to be happy. God wants us to be whole. God wants us to be whole and at peace. So God is all powerful and he is able to bring all people into peace with him. And therefore it's there. But as C.S. Lewis, the guy who said it, this is, um, uh, this is what I say. This is what he says. In the problem of pain, C.S. Lewis writes this, his omnipotence means the power to do that all that is intrinsically possible, not to do things that are intrinsically impossible. You may attribute miracles to him, but not nonsense. In other words, that if it's possible for a person to be happy, then God can do the things. But it's, if happiness is dependent upon the choices I make, then in order to make me happy, he has to violate the thing that makes me most like him, which is my ability to choose love and happiness. See, if I base love and happiness on my external circumstances, then I'll always blame God as to why I'm not happy. God, why aren't you doing anything about it? You either can't or you won't. You following me? But if I realize that my happiness and my ability to love others and choose joy and all those sorts of things, it's, that's on me, then I realize that, hey, maybe even some of the bad things in my life are driving me towards wholeness. And maybe there's a reason. C.S. Lewis also says this. He said, suffering is God's megaphone to wake up a deaf world. Because if God can't get my attention when everything's going great, how else is he going to get my attention? There are a lot of people that are happy right now that don't believe in God at all. They're not paying attention to God. So it can't be that happiness makes us believe in God. So how does God bring us then into wholeness, okay? So where does suffering come from? At its most basic level, suffering, number one, is a result of the fall. Genesis chapter three, that's what we do. Why does my knee hurt? Because of Genesis chapter three. Why don't I like my job? Because of Genesis chapter three. Oh, if we hadn't sinned in the garden, I'd never have to work. That's actually not true. Work is a part of the garden. Toil is the fall of man. Just in case you're wondering, you would have still had a job. You just would have loved it, okay? Uh, Sickness, illness, Uh, mosquitoes, it's all there, it's all right there, okay? Um, It's all there. It all comes from that moment. Everything was great, Adam and Eve did what they did, now it's not great. We said this way, God made it, we broke it, okay? So ultimately, all of this is our fault. It's not God's fault. God didn't do this to us. God set up a world in which we were able to choose, and we chose, And you say, well, I didn't choose. Yeah, but you chose at some point. You chose self-rule over reliance on God. You chose selfish indulgence over submission to to the God that you knew. We all do it. So it's kind of we broke it and we keep breaking it and we're going to keep breaking it. And that's why God looks at us and says, this is why we don't have nice things (laughs) right here. The other thing about suffering is it's actually built into natural reality. There's a very kind of a strange verse in Romans chapter 8, and it's in 18 to 24, and it talks about how creation groans for its own redemption, which means that even creation's kind of broken. Now, what's interesting is when we look at suffering, we tend to put like moral things to natural things. Like when something bad happens, like with a flood or a tornado or a hurricane, something like that, we're like, oh, that's so bad. No, it's just nature. That's just how the world works. And depending on your own worldview, we're either making it better or making it worse. But that's just the law of how the world works. So natural things aren't 
evil, they're just tragic. You following me? But when we say, well, that's evil, but there's a lot that we do. We're like, oh, I have health problems. You know, it's, it's, I, I can look at myself, right? Well, my back hurts. Well, your back hurts because of this. Because your body's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. So when you treat your body in a way it's not supposed to do it, sometimes it's not evil. It's just too bad. But we equate those things as the same. But when we understand that, eventually, like what we talk about next week with end times, don't forget, don't skip, even creation itself will be redeemed, right? It's very funny. I, my youngest daughter is very, like, she, she used to just really, really love and be to animals, like very sensitive heart for animals. She knew all about animals. She'd study animals, all that kind of stuff. And I remember we were watching a nature show. It's all a nature show. Look at the cute little whatever, the gazelle. And there's the lion. And the lioness rips the gazelle apart. And we're like, oh, and we're like, oh, our little girl. And she goes, no, that's what nature does. Like in her mind, she was like totally normal with it. But we moralize these natural things. And sometimes suffering is just, just happens. In fact, we could put it this way. I'll put it this way. This way, it's, um, This is why this next one, even though it's a part of natural reality, it's still under God's authority. Okay? Say, why would you say that? Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, and then there's the same thing in John 9. John 9, Jesus is, is in this encounter. He says, who what, who was it that sinned? And Jesus is like, nobody sinned. Sometimes people are just born blind, but you'll still see God's purpose in it. That's exactly what he says. In Matthew 5, 45, he says, he who causes the rain to shine on the just and the unjust. Sometimes it just rains. But when we say this natural thing is showing that God hates me, that's not always true. We say, oh, the devil's coming against me. I got a speeding ticket. No, the state trooper's coming against you. The devil's not engaged in this at all. There is this reality of just cause and effect and naturalness that exists all the time. And we, what happens is we tend to spiritualize that, and yet when God is actually working in our lives, we dismiss it as coincidence. So God could be doing something. Man, I tell you what, man, Brian preached on healing. I, heard, I saw that Facebook post on healing, or Brian preached on holiness, and then uh, Pastor Tim said something the other day, and then my buddy at work said the same thing. Man, what a coincidence. But meanwhile, I got a ticket. God hates me. Like there's no, so if the point is to point us to God, I gotta be ready to be pointed to God. I gotta be ready to hear what God is saying for me. Because even suffering, because it's still under God's authority, and this is one of the toughest things. So what happens sometimes is when I'm working with people, there's like my theologian side and my pastor side. And my pastor side and my theologian side get in a lot of fights because I can say something that's theologically true and emotionally devastating. Or I can say something that's emotionally very encouraging and supportive, but unfortunately, sometimes it's not theologically true. And I just hope I get it right when you're, you're like, I am never coming to Brian for any... Sweet, it's working. No, um, because suffering is, can be, and is actually submitted, still submitted to God's purposes. And that's a tough one to chew. Romans chapter 8, verse 25 through 20, 29. God is working all things together for your good. All things. Paul, in Philippians chapter 1, 12 and 18, you know what he says? For what has happened to me has served what? to advance the gospel, everything that had happened to him. And you think you've had a bad day, Paul would be kicked off a cliff and people would drop rocks on him. And he said that served to advance the gospel. I mean, think about that. I say that saying, that's tough. Because I know that to be true, and yet, it's difficult for me as a pastor to look someone in the eye and say, I'm sorry you're going through this. Maybe it's all for God's best. That sounds so horrific. It just does. I'll be honest. With you. I don't like saying that. That's why my typical answer is I don't know. But I do know that all things work together for God's. But what is the difference? It's do I submit it to God's purposes? Or do I own it and keep it for myself? 
This is my pain, God. This is my illness. This is my tragedy. This is my brokenness. This is my offense. This is my hurt. And I'm going to keep it here. Because if I keep it to myself, then it is tragic, it is random, and it is meaningless. But if I say even this dark thing, and again, I want to make it very clear, I am talking from a huge place of privilege because I've had an awesome life, okay? And I don't want to dismiss that some of you have experienced things, whether you're watching online or you're here in the room, you've experienced things that I cannot even wrap my brain around. So there's a little bit of shame in me saying this, but it's still true. That whatever has happened to you now, what are you or I or any of us going to do with it? Are we going to say, God, I can't imagine how this could ever work for your purposes. And there are things that happen to people that I can't imagine. You're saying, well, you mean God wanted that to happen? By the way, that's not what I said. That is not what I said at all, and we'll get to that in a moment. What I did say is it did happen, so what do we do with it now? What do we do with it now? And I, I, it breaks my heart to be that frank, but I don't know any other way to say it sometimes. Because I'd much rather say, I, 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 but again, there's a part of me that says, okay, so what do we do now? And I look at things that I've experienced, although not super extreme. I mean, I've been hurt. And, you know, I've had people hurt me and I've been offended and I've offended people and all that kind of stuff. But again, I'm sure there are stories in here. By the way, we're not going to have story time. Just don't, don't start freaking out. But where it's way worse. My question is be, okay, so it happened and it's horrible. So what are we going to do with it now? Are you going to sit in it? and let it define you and shape you and be everything about you for the rest of time and eternity? Or are you going to give it to God and say, God, you said, you're the one who said, you can work all things for your good. You're the one who had Paul say, whatever's happened to me has served to advance the gospel. So good luck, chief. Let's see what you can do with this. My thing would be, as my mom would say, hide and watch. Because it's amazing what he can do. Okay. All right, that's the heavy stuff. Okay, so our key verse for tonight, awesome verse. Isaiah chapter 53, verses four and five. This is a, an Old Testament prophecy about the Messiah where prophesying Isaiah says this, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. You can underline took up our pain, bore our suffering. Those are the key statements of there. He took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, sin. He was crushed for our iniquities, our sin. The punishment that brought us peace, wholeness, shalom, which I'll get to in a second. The punishment that brought us wholeness, not happiness, was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. So when my tradition says, salvation and that divine healing is provided for in the atonement, this is the verse we lean on. That's where we get that idea, that through the sacrifice of Jesus, it was not just a spiritual wholeness, but the potential of physical, emotional, relational, all-encompassing wholeness came and was instituted through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, okay? Now, does that mean that when I get saved, every get, I get healed? No, you're not, it's not like that. It's the potential, now in my life, is the potential for God to display his power so that others would see him at work in my life, just like your salvation. So we pray. Does God heal? Yes. Why does he heal? To point people back to him. Sometimes yourself and sometimes others. So what do we believe about healing? Well, number one, I just said it. I gotta go this way. I, we're not going that way. Oh, no, low battery. Okay. What do we believe about healing? Number one, healing is provided in Jesus. Healing is provided in Jesus. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 and 25. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we may die to sin and live for righteousness. Quoting Isaiah, by his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd 
and are the over and the over, overseers of your soul. Essentially, what we believe is that we can trust and believe for healing because of what Jesus worked on the cross. That in His brokenness brings wholeness. In the communion of the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, whatever you call it, it says that He broke bread and said, "This is my body." broken for you. Now, the problem is, is we always use like really nice, rich, fluffy bread. So it's more like, here's my body ripped for you. But they would have used unleavened bread, which would have like snapped and crumbs would have gone everywhere. So he would actually would have like broken. So even then Christ was saying, this verse you've heard about the Messiah and his brokenness bringing wholeness. Again, wholeness, that's the key, is now in me. And through his death, and resurrection and ascension, that series of events validates who he is as Jesus, therefore fulfilling the prophecies, and boom, in case you're wondering, it worked both directions. Well, how were people in the Old Testament healed? It's called transcendent efficacy, and you're welcome. All right, okay. All right. It means, it, never mind. Okay, all right. So here's another part that's, that's I think, that, that's critical about healing, is that healing is, even biblically, more than physical. More than physical. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs. So this is the verse prior to the one about the Messiah having healing provided for through him. He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. So the healing we experience, again, we tend to like separate things. Like I have my mind, and I have my body, and I have my spirit, and they're all three. And we think of our bodies like a cafeteria tray. And we're not. We're just a big thing of spaghetti. That's all we, we're all mixed up. You can't, you, can't, you can't undo it. That's why when you're nervous, you feel sick, right? So you, your brain's having a problem and you want to throw up. Your body is reacting to what your brain is saying. If you have spiritual unrest, now everybody's going crazy. So that's why we can believe for wholeness beyond physical things. Because the point of Jesus is to bring wholeness, peace from God and with God, okay? Say, so Brian, why are you on this? Because we talk about shalom, and shalom is this uh, Hebrew concept, and healing is a form of shalom, just in case you're wondering. So what does shalom mean? Shalom means peace. No, shalom means wholeness. It means peace in the sense of no fracture. It means completeness. It means integrity, and so if Christ has come to bring shalom, that means he's come to bring it in my spiritual relationships. He's come to bring it in my body as an evidence of his power. He's come to bring it in the relationships. We are agents of this shalom wholeness. And so if I'm, my hope for healing is always a hope for wholeness, okay, of completeness, okay? Okay. So this is a critical statement, and you, at this point, you can feel free uh, to disagree with me, but this is what I feel. Healing is to be sought and expected, but never demanded. Okay? Healing is to be sought and expected, but not demanded. That's why it's called the gift of healing and not the wage of healing. This gets tough. Because my tribe, the Pentecostals, are the world's worst at this. Because we lay out the formula. And we say, if you pray this way, and you do it with this formula, and you pray it the right way at the end, and you circle three times, and you spit on the ground, Jesus will heal you. Like, it's almost that bad. Well, I need a healing prayer. Well, how should I pray? Well, you got to pray this way, you got to pray that way. But when we get into that formula, I don't have time to get into this. But I think it's important to remember that most of the miracles in the New Testament, the ones that we base all of our theology on healing from, are really just ways to prove God's power over pagan magic of the first century. So like they would have all these things to cast out a demon and Jesus would just come up and say, you're out, like that's it. And everyone would be like, oh, what, what, what authority do you walk under? And they'd be like, oh, you gotta do this. And Jesus would say, oh, and then he'd, he'd mix it up. He's like, hey, this guy, I'm just gonna heal by saying it. This guy, I'm gonna put mud in his eye and he'll freak everybody out. Why does he do that? Because he's constantly disrupting this idea that you can figure out a formula and make God do what you want. Because that's not how God works. And that's tough because we wanna seek healing. We are told 
to pray for healing. We are told to expect healing. But if I demand healing, then I've taken it from a gift, a grace, to something that I'm owed. And now I'm asking the question, am I giving everything in my life to be submitted for the purposes of God? And that's tough. That's like an intellectual thing, and that's hard, and I, I, I realize that's a tough one, so I just want to move on, and I'm going to get ripped apart in the questions. Here we go. Okay. Because I think this is it. Let's look at the verse. Psalm 34 says this. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. Okay? So when you cry out to God, God hears you. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. Okay, think about that. He delivers them from their troubles, and he's close to the brokenhearted, which means that both exist, right? I wouldn't be brokenhearted if I was in trouble. Like, what it's saying is the point isn't always, the promise is not always healing. The promise is always that you're not alone in whatever you're going through, that God is with you in the suffering, in the conflict, in the trial, in the sickness, whatever. You are not alone. And oftentimes we say, where was God? And the truth is, is he's right here. He's right here, by the way, not only in his presence, but he's here through the body of, the, of, of Christ, through the church. Sometimes the reason prayers get answers is because we don't answer God's prayers. We don't answer to what God calls us to do. We, I could be the answer, not me, because you, you've heard about my great gift, but you right now could be the answer to somebody's prayer. Think about that. You, you, right now, if you would open your heart and mind to the voice of the Holy Spirit like we talked about last week, you could be the miracle someone's been praying for. That's how God works. But when we say, no, it only has to be through this, by this, in that way, then what we've done is we've reversed the roles. And we said, God, it has to happen here. And if the whole point is to point me to God, but I'm not even willing to pay attention to how God is working in my life, then would I have heard from him even if he did heal me? Or would I have just praised the doctors? Or would I have just said, wow, what a circumstance? Would I really have given credit to God as the one who did it? Why? Because of this next statement. The purpose of healing and the miraculous is to demonstrate God's love and power. John chapter 12, verse 44 through 46 says this, And Jesus cried out, Whoever believes in me does not believe in me only, but in the one who sent me. The one who looks at me is seeing the one who sent me. I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me would stay in darkness. In other words, Jesus, every miracle Jesus did was to point people towards himself as the Savior. That's why in John, the word for miracle is actually not miracle. John only uses the word sign. John actually doesn't use the word miracle in the Greek. He only uses the word sign. Signs and wonders, not miracles. It's a different word in Greek. Because John is trying to say, every story I'm about to tell you, he says it later on in chapter 20, I have written these things so you may believe. So really, my prayer in this moment can also be not only, and it, I just want to make sure no one, oh, Brian says we shouldn't pray for healing. That's not what I'm saying. That is absolutely not what I'm saying. Partnered with a prayer for healing is, God, advance the kingdom in my world. God, this is, I, my leg hurts, and I don't want it to hurt. I want it to stop hurting. Advance the kingdom in my world. Thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Total submission. Because if I'm totally submitted to the one who has sought only to bring me peace, then whatever the outcome, I will live in peace. But if I'm not submitted, then that shows that I'm not at peace with God. And this is tough because here's the fun part. We need to pray for each other. We need to pray for each other. Praying for a miracle brings the people of God together. We need to pray for each other. James chapter 5, verses 13 through 16 say this. Is any among you in trouble? Let them pray. Okay, so if things are bad, what do we do? We pray. Is any of you happy? Let them sing, sing songs of praise. So if things are bad, we pray. If things are good, we pray. Do you get it, how it's working? Don't let circumstance determine how involved God is in your life. 
Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. You ever wonder, why do we do that here? First Wednesdays, all the times we do that. Why do we do that? Why do they have that little vial that has the oil in it? Because we're obeying this. Because that's the formula? No, because that's the promise. The Lord will raise them up. The prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they've sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So we get into this, right? And people are like, okay, so prayer and confession and all that kind of stuff. Basically, what is James talking about? If you are not whole, come to the people of God and believe for wholeness. If you're spiritually fractured, let's find wholeness. If you're physically tormented, let's find wholeness. Do you see the continuum there? You say, well, is he saying that if you're healed, you'll be forgiven, and if you're forgiven, you'll be healed? No, he's saying about being whole. And there are even moments where Jesus, the, the, you know, they bring the guy to Jesus on the mat, and, he's, and they say, hey, you need to heal him. He says, your sins are forgiven. And it's like, that's not what we asked for. And Jesus literally says, what's the bigger miracle? That I can forgive someone for eternity, or I can make him walk? Fine, walk. The healing of the man was an afterthought. It was actually, in Jesus' own economy, a less significantly powerful miracle than the forgiveness of sin. I mean, we, we think about that. But we get caught up in the lightning bolts and the flash and the sideshow. And here's what's fascinating about this. James says, is any of you sick? Call for your own elders. Call for your own people. Because the prayer of a righteous person, a righteous man, is effective. And then he follows it up, and I didn't put this in your notes. He follows it up with, Elijah was a man just like you are. Well, I gotta wait. I gotta, I gotta, have, I gotta wait for such and such to come into town and pray for me. Elijah was a man just like you are. Well, I'm not gonna get healed if I don't have pastor come to the hospital and pray. For Elijah was a man just like you are. That person does not bring you healing. Christ brings you wholeness. Seek Christ. But what we do is we are tempted to turn people into celebrities and priests and witch doctors rather than believing in the miraculous for each other. And I, I believe that. I, I, I'm convicted about that. I grew up in it. I gave 10 bucks to the guy that said he would do it. Like, maybe that's just me. But you know what? I didn't give 10 bucks to Jesus. And maybe that's the lesson learned. Because I thought if I do it with this guy, it'll happen. But now I'm like, glasses? Brian without glasses? This is the brand, baby. Come on. <laughs> like I couldn't even fathom it. I've tried to wear contacts. I freak myself out. Because what has happened to me has served to advance the gospel. And there's things in my life I have prayed, God, take this away from me. I'm very open about my uh, attention deficit disorder. I'm very open about some of my, I have prayed, God, don't make me crazy anymore. But you know what? If God kept me a little crazy and I get to talk about it on a Sunday morning, then somebody who's not as crazy as me knows that at least I'm not as crazy as him and I've got a chance. <laughs> so if that means it's happened to advance the gospel, I don't use it as an excuse for sin. I don't use it as an excuse for doubt. I can't do that. But what I can do is have peace with it. Because I, I either trust God or I don't. I either trust God or I don't. Now, that being said, we pray, we believe, we trust, but that's what we do. We believe and we trust and we pray together and we do see miracles. We see them all the time. We see healing, we see provision, we see restoration. There are miracles in this room. And just because a leg didn't grow back or something like that, your marriage is a miracle. Think about that. You, the sheer odds of any one person ever being born is a miracle. I mean, just do the math. The fact that you're here on a Wednesday night listening to this guy with his glasses talk about the Bible. Who were you five years ago? And tell me it's not a miracle that you're here tonight. A miracle all around you. Elizabeth Barrett Browning put it this way. She said, every uh, heaven, earth is crammed with heaven. That's what she said. Earth is crammed with heaven and every bush is ablaze with God's glory. Some of us stop and look. The others just keep picking blackberries. 
Every bush is ablaze with God's. Are, am I going to see? Am I going to see the miraculous he's already done? Or am I waiting for one of the cool ones or one of the good ones? Or am I going to see myself? The greatest miracle of all, that the Lord, creator, and savior of the universe forgave my defiance and betrayal of him and said, come on home. I mean, that's the power of it. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are and what you do in our lives. God, I do want to pray in a moment for anyone either watching online or in our community right here that needs wholeness from you. Father, right now, we, we do believe physically in the miraculous. We believe in physical healing. We believe in financial miracles. We believe in relational miracles, and we know to ask for them. You said, if you have a need, don't be anxious about it, but pray about everything. The thanksgiving and supplication, knowing that the peace of God will guard our hearts and our minds, the peace of God that is beyond all understanding, but it comes from trust in you that you will bring wholeness into our lives. So, Father, for financial miracles, we believe. For physical miracles, we believe. For relational, for marriage miracles, God, we believe. For divine guidance and wisdom, we believe. And we say that you are Lord, and we ask that you would use our situation to demonstrate your glory to those around us. Father, we love you, and we thank you. We do this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And amen.